Richard Stewart, welcome inside the Crazy Ant Farm, man. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, whoa, these guys really are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> man i love that already that smile that every day just infectious man we are so pumped <laughs> to talk to you tonight my friend like not only to carry on the zoe's love because we've talked to a bunch of y'all and we just like we're fan man i'm still hoping roku picks that thing up like just give us another season man but i mean we got yeah, luke yeah. cage we, we we got p valley we got your performance at 54 below like just so many things that we want to talk to you about <laughs> bro oh thank you i appreciate that yeah i'm excited i'm excited to be here with y'all i'm i'm uh i'm, I'm just excited that there's, there's no real eloquent way of putting it it's just excitement so. no, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it well we want to introduce you to the fans and all the listeners out there this podcast is meant to help up and comers try to break into the entertainment industry so you know it's always good to mm-hmm. pass along everybody's upbringing so what about you, man? What made you fall in love with acting? What made you want to get into it? I mean, you know, what well, my okay. So I, I grew up in a really religious space in mm-hmm. the South, right? Um, my dad was a pastor, so there was a lot of storytelling with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but and I don't really talk about this, but I remember my mom. She was like a praise dancer, so she would she wore yeah. this like gown and she would walk up like walk she would move gracefully up and down aisles and shit like that you know Hell yeah. and i was just like interesting and then when i was in my room i would like dance by myself and i would play music and stuff like that but i didn't no one really knew that that was like me time um the the, the time where it kind of went public was my last semester of my senior year in high school mm. i had a classmate his name was chris Delette, and he was going to audition for a play I'd never done one before, but I saw my older sister do one the previous semester. And I was just, she was the cool kid in school. She was the homecoming queen. I was her brother. Like, no one knew my name. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you love that when you got a sibling and you're just that one? Yeah, you know, like, always fun. <laughs> it was, it was like, you know what? It was wonderful because I was like, I, I kind of relished that position in a way because folks would be like, uh, they'd be like, so you're you're her brother i was like yeah they're like really i'm like yeah they're like so how do i like she doesn't like you be my friends but not be my friends whatever i digress so um i was uh so i followed chris and coop was the head of the drama program shallow high school is where i went and um and she was like, she went around the room and there was all these people and she had everybody sing songs and stuff. And then she got to me and I just went with my friend, Chris. I was just there. And she was like, do you want to audition? And I was like, I don't do that. No. Nope. <laughs> and she was like, oh, she was like, okay, why are you here? Anyway, so she kept going. Then she went back to me and she was like, do you know any songs? <laughs> and I was like, not. I was like, not really. Like, not, not really. And she said, uh, do you know Happy Birthday? I was like, mm, you got me. And so I sang Happy Birthday. And then she cast me in, in the show. Well, the show that she cast me in was um, Once on this Island. And I played the character Papa Gay in Once on this Island. And I was like, you know, I was like way out of my comfort zone. And that's a theme in my career that I love. Oh, a yeah. lot of things that I've done have been, uh, there has been no proof that I can do it. And yet I still put myself in that position and commit wholly to it. Mm. And through the kind of alchemy of that process, I find out things about myself. Mm. I learn things about my instrument and I get closer and closer to um, like my artist heart. And so that was my introduction to acting. Right. And then I had to go to college for something. I wasn't really good at much. So I was like, I got, there was a good response from the show. And I had a friend, her name was Brittany Murphy Williams now. Um, cause you married. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the clarification. <laughs> I was like, just so you know, she's like, she's like, it's not my name anymore. John, it's been years. I have children. I have a family. I'm like, okay, cool. Whatever. So, um, <laughs> I get it. No, she, so she went to a school in South Georgia, Columbus state university. And I was like, you know, I really, I didn't know much about any of it. So I just, I just, she was the only person that I knew that did any acting and went to school for it. 
And she said um, that they were having auditions and I didn't really know how to do that. The only thing I'd done before is like I said, show up and sing happy birthday. Right. But I didn't really know any of the stuff. I didn't know about monologues. I didn't know about, you know, like actually preparing the song or anything like that. And so what I did was my favorite movie is Goodwill Hunting. So yes. I, I watched the movie again, right? There's that monologue, that classic monologue, Robin Williams on the bench. Oh yeah. He goes in and I learned that monologue. And I was like, cool, I'm going to audition for this program with this Robin, Robin Williams monologue. <laughs> so I, got to, I go and I audition, and I can't tell you how bad it was. It was pretty <laughs> fucking terrible. Like I, all, I remember, all I remember was like saying the words, but I, I remember I was started in the middle of the room, and at one point I was on this wall over here. And then at some point I was on the wall over there. I made it the Shakespearean, like high stakes fucking thing. I just, there was no subtlety. I was just yeah. all over the place. And after I did it, um, one of the teachers asked me if I sang and I told her no. And she was like, I don't believe you. And I said, um, Happy birthday. I was like, cool. Like, yeah, you like, uh, you know, <laughs> so, um, but that was, that was my, in, my entryway to any kind of arts type stuff. And it's been, a, um, there's a, I remember the first time, the first play I, I booked, I got cast in, in, in college was I hate Hamlet. Mm. There's a character uh, that doesn't come into the play for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I just was hiding under this couch for like the longest fucking time. <laughs> and I remember during a rehearsal, I actually went to sleep. I was snoring during one of the rehearsals. And they were like, John, John, <laughs> John is your entrance. <laughs> and I got up and I said, like, oh, no. But um, I, so it was, I hate Hamlet, but I didn't know how to create a character. I was just. Right. And uh, my friend Anthony, he now works. Um, uh, he works at Berkeley Rep. He works. He uh, does. I think he heads the education department at Berkeley Rep. Mm, nice. Um, but his name is Anthony Jackson, mm -hmm. and uh, he was like the, he was like the old head. He was like the, he was like elegant, and he was a black man. He was just like and I was just like I was like, dude, how do you? What do you? What am I supposed to do? Like, I, I'm in a, <laughs> like what do you? What am I supposed to do? They would the the director his name is Stephen Graver in the first rehearsal um I don't know how I got through uh once on this island without it but like bro I went through all of once on this island I didn't know what stage left stage right was I didn't know what any of that lingo was mm -hmm. so I go to the first rehearsal and Stephen is like so John you're gonna enter stage left and then you're gonna and I just like look at him <laughs> like <laughs> I'm just like and then everybody's looking at me like and I'm looking at him and he's like oh Okay, so, oh, so we're there. Okay, so, okay, so, um, <laughs> and he said it kind of like that, like a little, like a, like a little shady. Like, right, 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 right. Like, like, like he's like, he's like, cool. So, okay, we're there. So, stage <laughs> left. We're gonna take rehearsal time, right? And we're gonna go through this. And um, after that, I was like, I need to talk to somebody because I don't want to be embarrassed like that again. Mm -hmm. So I talked to Anthony. He gave me a list of questions to ask myself about character mm. and that was the first introduction to like you know building and asking myself questions and finding a character mm. and um you know to be quite frank like i if this is a you know free space i, I like to just um be honest about my, my journey uh i grew up in a very i was grew up in a very religious space mm -hmm. i also grew up like it was very very staunchly religious mm -hmm. very very like rigid and there were a lot of problematic things that I grew up with. And I remember acting being, I still had a lot of ideology in me. Oh yeah. Um, and it was, I remember I was, it was my first year of acting school and I had a teacher, her name was Lori Strickland. And I was doing a scene from Night of the Iguana, uh, Tennessee Williams. And there's a scene between these two men. And I was like, I was playing a scene and I was just like playing the scene. Mm -hmm. And then she started asking me, you know, um, you know, Tennessee Williams, you know, it's, there's a lot of subtext. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. Oh yeah. So she starts asking me questions about the scene I'm playing and she's like, and I, I start answering the questions and then she kind of poses the question to me, um, about, 
what their relationship is. Mm. And I was like, uh, I don't, I don't know. And then she proposed the possibility to me that maybe the relationship was a love relationship. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was like, I, I can't, I was like, I can't, I don't know. I don't, I can't, I can't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. And right. she said, I'll never forget it, man. She just looked at me and she said, have you ever loved anyone? I said, yeah. She said, okay, play the scene. And she just kept moving. Oof. Nice. And I was just, I was just like leveled. It like, that was the beginning of unraveling so much shit. Hell yeah. Oh yeah. Childhood. Oh yeah. It was so simple and so clear and so um, like to the core. Mm. And I was just like, I was like, and that that's another reason why I fell in love with acting. Because in putting myself in other people's shoes and people whose experiences are different from mine, I, it, it like expands my empathetic body. Mm, like for I, sure. It, it forces me to ask questions. It, it forces me to seek the truth. It gets me out of my comfort zone. Um, and so many times, you know, I, I, I feel like the, the roles that find us, I think they find us for a reason. Oh, mm. and, absolutely. And so like that, that is another thing. So that's all that. I feel like I've been monologuing for like 10 minutes. No, now. no man. But I love stop. that. Oh my I gosh. Love that. There's so much exactly. there to, to unpack with all of that. I just love how your very first introduction into it all, like you said, it was just something that you were just not, com you, it was out of the comfort zone. You were uncomfortable. You didn't know what you were doing and that you've been able to parlay that into every aspect of your career. Like you said at the top of the show that you take roles that are out of the comfort zone that make you feel, you know, like a challenge you and stuff. So to be able to take that fear and turn it into a tool to, to turn it into an mm. advantage moving forward is just unreal. And we talk about it all the time too, about how if art can make you start a conversation that might be uncomfortable normally, but you can talk about it because of what you've just watched or what you've just done, then that's the best thing about art is to start conversations that are uncomfortable to have and make them comfortable, right? So, I mean, I just love everything that you just unpacked there. Yeah, we like uh, we like quoting Emmanuel Acho. I don't know if you've ever heard of any of his stuff where you got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable in conversations and things like that. And so, yeah, I mean, that's basically what you were doing. That's how you were coming up. So that's that was beautiful. Oh, yeah. Honestly, <laughs> we couldn't ask for anything <laughs> better than that. Like, I mean, that like touched my soul. Seriously, okay. seriously, like, shit. Because there are probably a lot of people out there like you were that just think they're not good at anything, yeah. and and then they they're terrified to try something, or they're terrified to get out of that mm. comfort. And there's no growth unless you get out of that comfort zone, right? So you've got to overcome I, that fear, and you've got to go for it. And I just think your story is probably just inspired more people than you can possibly imagine to go. Well, maybe I can just get out there and try this. And what's the worst thing that can happen? They tell you they didn't like Happy Birthday and move on. On. Hey, yeah, you know, but you got to get out there and try that, right? And uh, it's Absolutely. just so inspiring, man. Well, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that uh, that affirmation. That means a lot to me. You know, I, it. I think sometimes we. I don't like the idea of. Well, let me frame this differently. I don't like to go with what I don't like. What mm -hmm. I do like is I like when people are open about their process and their journey, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I like when people. Um, there, when there's not this visage or this like idea that everything has been hunky dory and it's just like it's been magic. And right. mind you, I I, am, I have been on the receiving end of some incredible grace in my career. Like like people who have you know when I didn't have a, a ticket, a plane ticket, like helped me out and spotted me for a plane ticket so I could go to New York and take meetings when I I didn't know how there was. It was like the universe was calling me one way and I didn't have the means to do it. And they made that happen for me. But I also think that there's so much value in in the the kind of the guts of a thing. Mm. And, and like, you know, it's it's um because we, we don't have to Elizabeth Gilbert, did she she um there was this TED talk that she did, I believe, or it was a, a conversation she was having. I think it was a TED talk. Um and she talked about uh, people who move through the world curiously, mm. and and 
as opposed to moving with, and then some people who wake up and they're like, they know what they're going to do from the time that they come out the womb and they're like, we all know people like that. Come out the womb. They're like, look, for sure. I'm going to be <laughs> an accountant. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love accounting. I'm going to be an accountant doing it. That's right. You know, but for me, that's, this wasn't my story. Mm-hmm. And I kind of, I love that. I, 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 I didn't like it for a long time, but I've come to really embrace that mm-hmm. about my, myself because it kind of keeps my eyes open to a lot of different things. I'm curious. Mm-hmm. And I'm, that. I, 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 I found theater because of curiosity. And like that curiosity has sustained me in it. And it also creates space where the curiosity is the kind of the egg that begat this 54 Below show. Mm-hmm. I've never done anything like that before. That's, right. Talk about outside of my comfort zone and no evidence of I had a whole conversation with my vocal coach name is Doug Peck. We were uh, chatting um, before it. I was doing some vocal warm-ups. And he was just like, you know, because he also, in the, in the lessons, he goes to the heart space as well. And he's like, so what are you feeling? What's going on right now? And I just started saying, I was just like, well, you know, I don't know. I don't, I want to, I want to fly. What if I fall? What if I suck? What if I'm shit? What if I'm, all of this stuff starts coming up, right? right? And then I'm just, and then the thing that kind of breaks me is like, who am I? Like, who am I to be on 54? I, I know this stage. Like, I have friends who've been on this stage. I know the kind of people. Like, these are the people that normally do this. These are, you know, you know, these are people that I've seen on Broadway stages. These are, you know, people that I've worked with. You know, I, I have so much respect for them and for this space. Who am I to be there? Right. And I had this big question, and it kind of, I broke down, and he just was like, he said, "You're John fucking Clarence Stewart." Like, <laughs> and, <I was> like, <laughs> and that was for me. It was so, it was I, so funny because I was just like, <laughs> "Yeah, <laughs> yeah." But isn't that true? <laughs> isn't that true too? Though you have to get to the point with like you know being outside the comfort zone and all this kind of stuff. And you and like you posed the question, "Who am I now?" But then there comes that level where you have to believe and you have to know you belong on that stage. You, 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 you do belong there. You have the right to be there. You, all these people that you talk about, I've been there, I've seen them, I worked with them, I admire them and all this, but you know what? I belong here too. And that's why I'm here. And I'm going, I, I, you know, you got to get into that mind space that, that you deserve what's happening and, and what's going on for you. And that's a very intimate setting for anybody who's not really familiar with it. I mean, you're pretty close up to the, to the audience on that stage. If you choose to be, it's very intimate. And, um, what a way to just like, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm just going to be right here with you. And like, that's amazing, man. <laughs> Thank you, bro. I, I appreciate it. I got to give credit where credit is due. My, my, my manager, Jane Berliner, she was like, I've been talking about writing a one-man show for a while. I was like, yeah. I really want to write a one-man show. I think it'd be way out of my comfort zone. I want to incorporate music and dance in it like I discovered in myself and Zoe's thing that I didn't know existed. Right. right. Wow. This is, this is also part of my instrument. I was like, I have to, I don't want to leave this in the background. I want to create with this. Mm. And she she pitched me for a show at 54 Below, and I don't know how the whole thing works out. She was like, uh, so I got a suggestion. I got a... And like, <laughs> listen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. She was like, so 54 Below. And I was like, you mean... 54 below 54 below right like you mean like (laughs) like is is there another one like you know below below (laughs) like you know like like 54 above yeah right right (laughs) she was like and she was like no that one just know that one and i told it was like 24 to 48 hours i was just like mulling it over Mm. over. and i was like um all the feelings started coming up and i realized i was like oh that's just fear Mm mm-hmm that's just fear. Okay, so and 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 you know, using that as uh, kind of uh, an arrow pointing in a direction of where I need to go, mm-hmm. and being like, I don't know, man. I, all of these, I don't know. Maybe it's not the right thing for me right now in my career. Blah 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 blah. All that <laughs> bullshit, right? And then being like, maybe I need to keep myself open. You ain't doing shit, bro. What are you like? Doing stuff? <laughs> and then like, <laughs> so it's like, you know what? It's like. Like, you know what? Okay, so I'm, I'm afraid, which is why I need to do it. Mm-hmm. And when I said yes to it, it was like, okay, so how do I want this to look? And I was like, I I don't, I wanted it to be um, very, very personal. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I love singing now. You know, it's taken a long time for me to, to get to the place where I've accepted that and um, the kind of singing that I really, really enjoy and all of this stuff. So what I did was I made a list of all the songs that moved me, mm -hmm. all right? And uh, most of them, some of them were musical theater, most of them were not, just different kinds of songs. And then when my girlfriend and I were traveling to um, her friend's wedding in Vermont, we were driving from Boston to Vermont. Mm. On that drive, we just played song after song after song. And I was like, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. And then I started working with Doug. And as I sang the songs, the ones that wanted to be in the show kind of made themselves known. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. And it was like, it was like, oh, okay, these need to live in the show. And then it was finding the order of them and uh, what kind of started bubbling up was, okay, all of these songs are like letters. They're like, these are, all of the songs are very much stories. Mm. They're super story driven. And they, the reason I love them is because they're very story driven. Yeah. And I was like, okay, with, if these are letters, and even the, the night before the show, I was pacing around this apartment in Brooklyn I was staying in. And I was just like, going through this song. I was like, hey, this is a letter. Who is this letter to? And like, people started coming to mind. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. 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 And one of the words that I, the, the experience I wanted to create in the space, I was like, yo, I wanted to be, I wanted to feel like magic. Mm. And, and I told someone that, and they looked at me like, cool. <laughs> 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 so, how do you, uh, okay, great, that's great, esoteric, whatever, but like, how do you make this? And so, you know, with that is kind of the, the, place that I was moving towards I was like in order to do anything it has to be specific mm -hmm. it's the tenets of storytelling for me specificity makes it universal mm. and um I'm the person on the stage and so I have to have the courage to make it specific and the stories that I was drawn to were stories that um they 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 moved me and so I it was inherently very specific and in that, trusting that, you know, you have the, the audience is, is that secret ingredient. Oh, yeah. Right. And when I'm in a space with them, you know, that you're in a space with them, that's the moment where you realize, where I realized, you know, working on it here, working on it there, Daniel Rudin is, is my accompanist, incredible. We only, Fun fact, my accompanist dropped out of the show a week and a half before. Oh, shit. Oh. LA. oh. And then a bunch of people, some Zoe's cast, were helping me out. And some other folks were like, you know, trying to send me names, names, names. And this guy, Daniel Rudin, <clears throat> 23, young dude, uh, got on the phone with him and had a great conversation. And I'm going to give him his props. Yes, I'm going to do that. So, he asked me, is there anything that you want to hear from me just so you can hear what I do? And I was like, you know what? Yeah, there's a song called The Waking by Kurt Elling. Um, if you want to take a pass at that, that'd be great. I forgot that there's no sheet music to that song. Mm -hmm. That song is only, I've only ever heard that song on played by a bass live or in a recording. It's just a bass in Kurt Elling. That's mm. it. But there's no sheet music. So I gave him basically an impossible task. And within three hours, he had come, he had transposed it onto the piano and sent wow. me that. And I was like, "Holy fuck!" Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're and hired. I was like, "Okay," and choose. Yeah, I was like, "Dude," okay, and choose one song that you love. And he shows both sides now by Joni Mitchell. Mm. And he did his thing with that. And um, on our phone call, I was like, "I really want to make something special. I want to be personal." He said, "I can hear that in songs," and I got you. I'm, my my background is in jazz and improvisation. I do a lot of different things, but I'm I'm okay moving in, in the moment, and that was really important to me. So when I flew to New York, so I'm in LA. I flew there three days early, or well, four days early, but a night before. The next day, I rehearsed the tent for three and a half hours. Next day, we rehearsed for an hour. Next day, we rehearsed for an hour. Then we did the sound check. Then we did the show. Wow, wow. So it was like. Bop, 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 right. Bop. Yeah. And I mean, he 
we it was mad it was so it was magic it was beautiful like we we talked through all of the songs i sang them we find we found our rhythm mm-hmm. and it was um so much of it was like playing you know it's like playing tennis with your friend on stage mm-hmm. right and you know and it was it was alive and you know never the same each night which is something that i love for sure each night was even even the stories that came out were different and i just told him you know hey i was like do you know i mean before we went out there he said do you know what you want to say in between songs you should you have that down i was like yeah uh no (laughs) Um, (laughs) didn't even think about that shit no (laughs) no but like there's the stories that have been coming up right as i've been singing the songs and and what the thing that was I was really excited about was being in front of being on the stage in front of everyone mm. and singing or about to go in like transitioning into a song or finishing transitioning out of a song and having the opportunity to communicate why it's there and just sharing that. Right. And you know, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to like, I didn't want to show them, right? I didn't want to go boom. Oh, I even said in one of the performances, I, was like, I didn't want to do jazz hands. That's what I said. I didn't want that. I wanted it to be like an invitation into me. Mm. And like, and that was, it. It was, I felt like we did that. And it's one of the things that I'm most proud of. And I'm excited to do it again. I learned a lot about myself. I yeah. bet. Yeah, I can imagine with the transition with different songs. and But it's really great you being able to find your voice, find your singing voice, because let me just say, I love your singing voice when we <laughs> fucking started watching Zoe's because I was late to the game. I'm not going to lie. He got me on it. But when we started watching Zoe's, all of a sudden, man, like I was like, where has this guy been my whole life? <laughs> like, like, he is so fucking good at like everything. And like, I didn't care. I didn't. Everybody else in that house was Team Max. I was Team fucking Simon. No. <laughs> I, was, I just want you to know, bro. I was here for you. <laughs> we have to clarify, though, okay? Me, me and my kid, we, we were Team Max, but it had nothing to do with you. It just had to do with Max. <laughs> like, 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 I just need to clarify that. Yeah. We were rooting for you to get through. It wasn't personal. It wasn't personal. No, it wasn't it personal. personal. That's right. It was because it, it, it was the characters. It was the no, right. It right. wasn't even you know. like like all. That's funny though because you say that because like the whole time I'm watching it, I'm literally rooting for you to work through everything you're working through right. and get to where you need to be. But I'm hoping Max is going to be the guy. You know, it's all it's yeah. like hey, Simon is going to be fine when he figures his shit out. But Max, <laughs> Max needs her. So, you know, that's Max is ready. That's Max right. Ready. He's ready. He's ready. <laughs> that's right. And you're like, Simon, he's just not. He's you. He has a marathon to run. Right. right. Like Iron Man. Right. Yeah. Five of them. OK. He even- so <laughs> settle this debate because we were literally talking about this before we went on with you. Like. Oh, okay. Were you gonna tell your fiance about the the feelings that you had, or were you just gonna let that slide? And because she figured it out, so like, but were you ever gonna own up and be like, "Hey, this this kind of going on," you know, get cleared up right now? Were you gonna be honest with her? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure. So. I do think that was I do think that was gonna be that, but I think it was it was gonna be like my my fear for Simon was that it would he would he would do it, but it would be. Um, it wouldn't be as uh, it wouldn't be as decisive as right, those things right, need to be. Right, like those things need to be that needs to be clear, decisive. It needs to be for sure. Uh-huh. And I think Simon was so wanting to be the good guy. Yeah, right. right. Wanting to not be not wanting to you know doesn't want to hurt anybody's feelings and mm-hmm. all of that stuff. Right. That I don't think he would have made it as firm as it needed to be. Mm, yeah. And so the way that things happened in the story, I think, really, really works because there it's like you cross the Rubicon. There's no going back. Right. right. There's no, right. you know, um, which he needed in order to go on the journey of like exploring self and learning self and grieving, actually grieving without mm. worrying about the impact on the people around him in the same way. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, we have to talk about it because there were two songs that specifically stuck out to me. The Simon and Garfunkel song that you sang in the very first episode that was just like very heart touching. <laughs> and then the last ensemble song, American Pie. I mm. mean, both of those like 
Oh, I cried so cried like a baby. hard, man. Like, I mean, what was just mm. that experience like? One, you know, performing legendary songs, and then two, performing with this cast that just every single person just knocked it out of the park. It was, I mean, it was unlike anything I've experienced. Yeah. It was, it was a singular moment, mm. you know? I remember when we were shooting American Pie, I'll start there. We were shooting American Pie and doing the rehearsal and understanding that in order to get that wonder, there were so many things that had to go right. Mm-hmm. Right. The crew, it was, it was like the, one of those moments on set, moments on set where everybody's always working incredibly hard. Right. right. But it was one of those moments where as an actor, you, you're looking at the entire machine doing what it needs to do. Mm-hmm. Right. To execute, to execute what happens inside of a frame. Mm-hmm. Right. It's, it's so magical because, and so watching the Warner kind of take shape and then looking back, I remember we, we did a take and everyone felt it. Everyone was like, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. And then we obviously did another one. For sure. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. One. yeah. But you know, yeah. That was the one. Yeah. That was yeah. The one. yeah. You know. <laughs> and then I remember we, we all went, we all went to video village and we sat down and we were like all watching it. And we were all crying. We were, and I was so good about it for me as well as that my little brother was visiting me on that day. And so, um, he was able to be there and be in video village and like watch it all happen and be, you know, a part of that mm. moment. Yeah, And I think that it was so, you know, it was, it was so special because of, for me, just, uh, the, the soul of the show, uh, right? you know, Mitch, just the soul of the show, like, yeah, yeah. When, like, and being able to honor that moment and kind of the kind of hollow feeling that happens after someone transitions and everybody's experience of all of the life things that are happening as mm-hmm. well. It was, it was, it was, it was masterful storytelling, man. And oh, there's no, sure. there's no two ways to put that. It's just, and it was so ambitious, which mm-hmm. was, it's the, it's the why we do what we do. You, you, you want to be a part of something that's taking a big swing. Yeah. And sure. that yeah. felt like a big fucking swing mm-hmm. and it paid off, man. I, oh, I just, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so hoping, like that. I said, I'm hoping Roku. I mean, it was the the Christmas one was a massive success for them. You know, the the, the yes. everybody's watching the old episodes with. The, I hope that they just realize this is something that need we need to come back to and continue. Right? Uh, it, it's just it, it like you said, it's mm-hmm. masterful, and and we need to see more of it. I want to though talk because of what you said at the beginning of the interview and about your 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 upbringing and and the ideology and the struggles and everything that you went through. P Valley and, and and your character on P Valley because we talk about all the time now mental health and how important it is and how sometimes overlooked it is and that storyline with your character and and the mental health aspect of it and then the adding on to it being a black man and then potentially the mm-hmm. the, the the homosexual aspect to it about maybe not knowing the the love of the or the relationship that he has talk about that a little bit about the character mm. and the storyline because we're getting tight on time and then you in real because this is an industry that's like built on literally you know selection or rejection and mental health is key mm-hmm. so talk about your challenges there as well if you can as quickly as you can <laughs> I know that was a well, lot no, I so what well, well, no, it's all good. Let's go. So for me, mental health is a very much a part of my life. I lost my dad when I was 19. So it's mm-hmm. like, you know, my, I have, I, there's a, there are these moments I have, I, I have been through some really dark valleys and I'm familiar with the bottom, you know, mm-hmm. um, and some of the things that Teak went through um, in some of the places where his mind went, they're not foreign to me. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, so there's, there's that. And I think that one thing that I have that he didn't have is tools. I've been in therapy and, and had like, I have resources right. and tools and like people to help me put language around the things that I'm moving through. And I think that that's why one it's why stories are so important and stories like teaks are so important because sometimes there are people who are, who have lived experiences like him mm-hmm. or lived experiences that are shades of his mm-hmm. that, don't see themselves that don't see um there's no language to put around the thing they're experiencing in the world that just that, that it just doesn't feel true mm-hmm. so there's no kind of acknowledgement outside of themselves and so 
um, I felt honored to play Teak. Mm. Um, it was a challenge. It was one of the most um, difficult things because I knew it was one of the most difficult things I've ever done because I, I knew that he was going to be there for a limited time. I knew that when I signed on. Mm. I knew that he wasn't going to be there, but I didn't know how he was going to go. And I was actually shooting Zoe's so story in Christmas when I read the final episode. Oh, oh wow. wow. Was, yeah, so I was in the trailer getting ready to go in and shoot my last scene for that while I read that. And I <laughs> bawled. And he broke down. Yeah, fuck. Just I the was just... mental aspect of that. <laughs> You're oh, shooting my. Zoe's Christmas and you read the script that Teek's killing himself. Oh, that that alone God. must have just been, what the oh. fuck? Like... <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I was like, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> oh, sorry, showrunner, writer, genius, and I was like, yo, what the? Fuck? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yo, what the? I was like, this is, I was like, this is, in, this is incredible. Like, yeah. As an and also as an actor, you, I'm still relatively young in my career, mm-hmm. right? And uh, to be able to go through an arc like that in those episodes, the finite amount of time. But Teat gets to go through all of the highs and all of the lows mm-hmm. of being human in that time. That's such a gift. Right. And I find that um, the people's experience of watching the show really mirrors the experience of those who have lost people. Yeah. Like his, his, his end was so abrupt. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I kept hearing was, but he had so much more life to live. I wish he was there. He had so much more. He had, there was so much more. There was so much more. And that's the way it is. That's the way it is when... That happens yeah. when suicide happens. When um, and the fact that there was a lot of light in him, um, but not many people around him knew what was going on inside. That's also very true. So I just wanted to honor that. And mm. the places where the writers, Katori, she loved the character. She knew what she wanted to do with him, and she she entrusted me with him. And she she just knew she wanted. I needed to be able to go all the way. And I feel like we did that. And I, a lot of credit to J. Alphonse, incredible actor that I was out acting opposite the majority of the time. It was a joy. I know him from New York and it was just a joy to work with him. It's a, I love what I do, man. I love yeah. being oh, an yeah. And I mean, dude, you know? I, you're like, like I said, only have seen you for a short period of time, but you've become quickly one of my favorite actors. And I mean, just everything that you've been doing has been knocking it out of the park. So we just can't thank you enough for coming on the show. We would love to have you back on literally oh, sure. whenever. Um, we're always down for an open conversation. <laughs> um, but man, like a fucking time. I hate I, I know. Uh, I hate the time constraint. Yeah, but thank you so it's much. Thank you so much. Again, open invite, man. I Anytime mean, you ever want to come back on, we got you. you. You know, you said a gift. Thank you. This interview was a gift. Yes. Honestly, for us, for our listeners, I think that what you do and how you inspire and, and just the way you live your life and present yourself to the people and, and what it, it's a true gift. Uh, every single part of it and we're just blessed to have had you on man seriously thank you so much that means a lot to me I, i'm so great thank you for having me oh my goodness oh my gracious that goes down in my top five best interviews we've ever had uh i uh, same i mean there, there's just no denying it i mean what an inspiration like i i, I mean i was just like like feeling it from the inside like like every word he was saying i was just hanging on it It, it's like that's the kind of guy that you want out there in the world and Mm -hmm. and and just like delivering his message and showing people how it's done i mean that's the kind of guy that does yeah exactly man exactly those are the type of role models that, that should be put in that position that can inspire others like Put a positive message out there and just bring forth that energy that helps people continue moving forward because, I mean, you know, there's so much stuff in the world that is dark and nasty. and But, I mean, when you have that light in somebody that you can tell that they're a good person, that's what it's all about. Yeah, and, and, and I think the thing I took the most away from that interview is that because of his light, because of, like, what you said and the way that he— it, I think his message was very clear that it's okay to not be okay. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have everything the way you think it should be. And you can still be a huge success and make a difference in the world. And I think, I think he proves that. Exactly. And the same with not being in your comfort zone. It's good to get outside of your comfort zone, but man, oh man, thank you again, John Clarence Stewart for coming on the show.